I'm going to be going through four specific sections. This is more of a background, and then we'll get into the proper stuff in a later video. But this is really going to be the thorough understanding of integration. So number one, why integration exists. Number two, integration as the reverse of differentiation. Three, the constant of integration, what that means. And section four, definite integration and the meaning of area. All right, guys, so you may already know differentiation as the instant rate of change, how steep something is right now. But integration, what integration asks is what happens if we add up every single tiny change on that journey? That one shift in perspective changes everything. Instead of focusing on a single moment, integration lets us see the entire picture. How far you've traveled, how much area you've covered, how one smooth curve can tell a story of countless invisible pieces. Let me show you what I mean. Imagine now you're driving a car. It's a nice hot day, you're driving a car, and your speedometer shows how fast you're going. Now that's your derivative. That's the rate of change of distance. But what if you want to know how far you've actually traveled after 10 seconds? You can't just look at a certain speed you did at a certain time. No, you have to add up every small movement to get to that figure. That sum, the total of all the little bits, that's integration. It's like collecting every snapshot of motion and combining them into one complete picture. So, if differentiation breaks down the story of motion into individual moments, integration rebuilds that moment by moment back into the full journey. And here's the exciting part. Every single rule you learned in differentiation can now be flipped. Where you used to go down a power, you now go up a power. Where constants vanished, they now appear. And suddenly, you're no longer just analyzing curves, you're creating them. Let's see how this process actually works, starting with the most fundamental idea of all. Integration as the reverse of differentiation. All right, so now we know why integration exists, let's talk about how it actually works now. We already know that if we differentiate x to the power 3, we get 3x squared. But what if I gave you 3x squared and asked you to go backwards, to find the function it came from? This is the first puzzle of integration. In essence, you're trying to find the original function. The one that when differentiated would give you what you currently have. In notation form, we write this as the integral of 3x squared dx is equal to x to the power of 3 plus c. And that fancy s symbol, that's basically what it is. It's a stretched out s which stands for sum. Because deep down, that's really all we're doing here. We're just adding up the little bits under the graph. Okay, so let's test this out. If differentiating x cubed gives 3x squared, then integrating 3x squared must bring us back to x cubed. So the question becomes, what if we had something like 4x cubed? What do you think the reverse would be? Well, 
When we differentiate x to the power 4, we get 4x cubed, which means if we integrate 4x cubed, we must, by extension, get x to the power 4. As you can see, that's our first pattern here. Notice what happened here. When differentiating, the power went down by 1. When integrating, the power goes up by 1. It's the perfect mirror image. So let's generalize this here. If we integrate x to the power of n, we increase the power by 1, and then divide by that new power. So in other words, the integral of x to the power of n dx is equal to x to the power of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. Now this one formula is going to be your best friend throughout integration, and it works for any rational power you can possibly imagine. Integers, fractions, even negatives. Except for minus 1. Why? Why do you think? Well, as you can see, when we have n equals negative 1, that involves division by 0. There's a different method for this, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Okay, so now that's the simple case. But maths is never really going to be that generous, right? What happens now when you've got something inside the brackets? Something like 2x plus 3 squared. If we try to integrate this straight away, it doesn't match our rule yet. Why? Because we've got a chain sitting right there inside the power. So when we reverse it, we actually have to compensate now for that inner times 2 that we'd normally get in differentiation. That's why now the integral of 2x plus 3 squared dx becomes 2x plus 3 cubed over 6 plus c because we increase the power by 1 divide by the new power and also divide by the inner coefficient so what we've got now is a process a mirror reflection of differentiation but with twists each time you integrate you're not just climbing back up the power ladder, you're undoing every step you took when differentiating. But wait, you may have noticed this mysterious plus C popping up in every result. Well, what's that about? And why can't we just leave it out? Well, that constant is the missing piece of the puzzle. It's the part of the function we can't see from its derivative. And if we don't account for it, we're not really reversing differentiation properly. So what is this constant of integration? To answer that, let's step back to differentiation for a second. When we differentiate either of these curves, we get the same result. dy by dx is equal to 2x. That means that if I hand you 2x and ask you to integrate it, there's no way to know whether the original curve had a plus 4, a minus 7, or a plus 12. They all collapse down to the same derivative. That's why we always write the integral of 2x dx equals x squared plus c. The plus c represents every possible vertical shift, every curve that shares the same slope pattern. The key here is the fact that when you differentiate, 
You're only talking about how fast something changes, not where it started. And so integration finds the total change. But unless you know the starting point, you can't pin down the exact value. So we write plus C to say in essence, there could have been any starting position. Now, sometimes the exam will give you that missing ingredient in the form of a point on the curve. So for example, let's say we're given the question dy by dx is equal to 2x plus 1. And we're told that the curve passes through 2, 5. And it therefore says to find the equation of this curve. So if we give this a crack here, step one, first thing we need to do is integrate this function. So when we do that, we get y is equal to x squared plus x plus c. But now there's a problem. We have the plus c, so what do we do? Well, we're going to use the given point 2, 5 to find c. So let's plug in x equals 2 y equals 5 and we therefore get 5 is equal to 2 squared plus 2 plus c which means that c is going to equal negative 1. Therefore we can say that y is equal to x squared plus x minus 1. That's how we recover the exact curve and without that extra piece of data you'd only know the shape not the position. Now, there's one special case where this constant quietly disappears when we now move from indefinite integrals to definite ones. Suddenly, you don't need plus c anymore, and that's not a coincidence. So the question is, how can you remove the constant without breaking the maths? Let's take a look. Up to now, every integral has ended with plus c, a whole family of curves. But in the exam, you'll often be asked for a single exact number. So here's today's puzzle. How can integration give a definite value with no plus c? Take x cubed, for instance. We know that the integral of x cubed dx is equal to x to the 4 over 4 plus c. Okay, now let's pin that between two x values. Say 2 and 4. That right there is a definite integral. So, if we integrate this first, we get x to the 4 over 4 between 4 and 2. We've got this now. Now let's evaluate at the ends and then subtract. So therefore we get 4 to the power of 4 over 4 minus 2 to the power of 4 over 4. And what does this give us all together? Well, that gives us 60. Now where did the plus c go? Well, the plus c cancelled. Okay, it always cancels in a definite integral. Now make sure to pay attention to this bit because if you don't understand it, it can trip you up in the exam quite easily. When a question asks for area, what the mark scheme wants is a non-negative result. What this implies is that the integral and the area are not necessarily the same, okay? So if we look at an example of this, um, let's take a look at a curve here. The parabola y is equal to x squared minus 4. Now between minus 2 and 2, every part of this curve sits below the x-axis. So if we integrate it, the result is going to come out negative. Not because the area itself is negative, but because the y values themselves are negative. So from a mathematical perspective, the integral here is 8 over 3 minus 8 minus negative 8 over 3 plus 8 is equal to negative 32 over 3. Okay. 
but the actual area itself is the positive of this. That is 32 over 3 square units, because the area cannot be negative. To take an example that really is, illustrates this point, let's take a look at the curve x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x between 0 and 2. Okay, now as you can see, we have a negative section and a positive section. So if we want to find the integral here, we can simply do the integral over the entire section. And when we do, we get 16 over 4 minus 8 plus 4 minus 0 is equal to 4 minus 8 plus 4 is equal to 0. So therefore, our integral here is 0. We've netted out, in essence. But as you know, the area can be different to the integral. Okay? And this is a perfect illustration of that. So as you can see, if we have a negative part and a positive part, we don't take account of that. Okay, the mark scheme only wants absolute values for the area. And so what we do firstly is we're going to find the area between 0 and 1. And when we do that, we get an answer of a quarter. Okay. Next, if we take the area between 1 and 2, we get a negative value there. However, that doesn't matter. That negative quarter doesn't matter because we only care about magnitude. So therefore, we have a quarter plus a quarter, and therefore the total area is going to equal a half. The conclusion to draw from this is that when calculating the area between a curve and the x-axis, you should carry out separate calculations for the parts of the curve above the x-axis and the parts of the curve below the x-axis. That way you won't get confused between the integral and the area calculation.